gather together once a week on Wednesday, normally at 1230. We're starting a little late uh, this afternoon, uh, but we gather normally at 1230 on Wednesdays to come together to seek to be able to rightfully divide the word of God, to discern uh, the meaning of Holy Scripture. And so we welcome all of you, those who are joining on Zoom, those who are joining on Facebook and, and YouTube uh, and on our website. Uh, this is a fully interactive Bible study. It does not require for you to have degrees in theology or Bible or history or anything else. There are no bad questions or stupid questions or, or uh, uh, taboo questions that you cannot mm -hmm. ask. We try to have an open and a uh, honest discussion about what it is that we find in the word of God. Uh, I may not have the answers to all of your questions. Um, I may even have more questions after you ask questions. I, I hadn't thought about that. And here's three more things that I hadn't thought about. But what, I, what we try to do is see if we can find it. Uh, we oftentimes try to answer scripture with scripture to see if there are other places where uh, the, the, the Bible speaks to the possible answers to the question that we ask. Uh, and if we cannot find it there, it may be that we need to look elsewhere and come back and maybe next week or the week after, see if we can bring back an answer. Sometimes we are, uh, we take peace in the great mystery that uh, scripture speaks that there are, are, there are mysteries and there are things that we do not know. Uh, there are things that belong to God. Uh, there, there are things that we come to understand through the movement of the Holy Spirit. And so we began our study with praying over the word. Uh, this is the first step in terms of seeking to interpret what thus saith the Lord. So let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for the opportunity to study your word, to seek after your will and your way, to try to rightfully divide and discern, to understand the meaning of your wisdom that is contained within these testaments, one called New, one called Old, Hebrew Bible, Newer Testament, 66 books. Some have books beyond that, dear Lord, but we today seek to study this word that we have, that you have given us and has been preserved over time. Give us the right questions as we seek the right answers. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together and say together, amen. Amen. So, we have been studying uh, the Johannine corpus of biblical literature, which includes the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the Revelation of John, the last book of the Bible. And uh, we have been working through the Gospel of John over the last couple of weeks, and we will continue to work through the Gospel of John. And now we are up to chapter 10. And so we're going to deal, uh, we're going to try to deal with two chapters today and see if we can get through all of it. Uh, some of this will be familiar. Uh, some I referenced uh, in our um, uh, sermon on last Sunday when we talked about Lazarus. So we're going to talk about Lazarus in chapter 11, but we're going to begin with Jesus the Good Shepherd. We um, oftentimes have multiple versions of the Bible. Oftentimes what I would do is I would go ahead and I probably can do it here uh, while we're talking uh, to put, to, to pull up a a shared version. Um, and let me just ask just for the, those who are on the call right now, um, what versions of the Bible are you reading from? And even, you know, if you're reading from a different version of the Bible that you, um, uh, I, I'm curious what, what version of the Bible that you study from that when you're, when you're reading your Bibles at home, what are the versions of the Bible that you're reading from at home and what versions of the Bible do you have in front of you today for the study. Anybody want to start? I have NSRV. NRSV, okay. New <laughs> NRSV, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but often uh, I use the uh, Amplified. The Amplified Bible, okay. Mm -hmm. Barbara, what do you think? NIV. NIV, New International Version, okay. And Nicole? Um, NRSV. Nicole used NRSV, uh, Sharon says NRSV mostly sometimes the message Bible. And so what I'm gonna do is just also for the benefit of those who are watching and may not uh, have come prepared with their Bible uh, in front of them, uh, I'm going to, uh, we'll, we'll start with the NRSV and we can look to see if it, if it reads different uh, in other, in other uh, versions. Sometimes there are distinctions that give us reason for pause and reflection. So I want to start with um, uh, verses one through one through ten 
of the hang on and, and i and i want to just i'm going to take it off here and just do the whole chapter here we'll start with one through ten um and i'll read first how about that um verses one through ten very truly i tell you anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly okay any any reflections on on this this first passage of scripture and just to remind us that where we ended last week jesus was talking about blind people and spiritual blindness right those who were walking in the dark uh those who who don't think that they're blind and so really have sin and those who are blind and that he is the light and we and we spent some time kind of unpacking that that's where we ended in chapter nine and so then, you know, Jesus then makes a transition. Uh, and in the Gospel of John, you have a lot of speeches, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of sermonizing that, that Jesus gives. And so here he goes into a description of what the NRSV gives as a, as a subheading, Jesus the Good Shepherd. Any thoughts about these first 10 verses? I'm curious why uh, he repeatedly says gate right? Not bridge or not passageway or anything else. And I just wanted to see your thoughts on why, why is that, was that a standard thing of people who, who did literally have, you know, shepherds were, were gates a standard thing. So that's just an, an easy way for him to, to help them understand it. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly think that um, if you had a, 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 a sheep fold or it, it would be an enclosure that would be enclosed by a stone um, and then there would be a gate. So yeah, frequently what, and th this is one of the, one of maybe the only place uh, or the closest thing that we have in the gospel of John to a parable, where in a parable, a parable, you're using those things that are familiar, those references that would uh, resonate with the, with the local and spiritual meaning. So his much more common uh, as, as, as a way of, making connection to the people. And we're assuming here, let me ask this, let's do what some of our exegetical work here right quick. We talked, we prayed over it, but so, and we dealt with what it says and we can deal with that more if we need to. Who's speaking in this text? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is speaking. We just wanna make sure we clarify that. Who, who is he speaking to? His disciples. Yeah. Hmm, you think so? Okay, why do you think he's talking to his disciples? I don't know. I just said it. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, well, certainly, you know, the beginning of the text, uh, we, we, we later find is Jesus speaking down in verse six. So, uh, so that's how we can know that's in speaking, but it doesn't say who he's speaking to. I think that we're, you know, likely assuming that um, drawing off of the end of chapter nine, verse 40, he's still speaking to the Pharisees. Okay, so in, in chapter 9, verse 40, it says, some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. And then it kind of flows into the next chapter. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and again, what we should all also know as we study the Bible, and so we don't get uh, rigid about some of it in terms of its structure, the, the whole structuring of the Bible in terms of the designation of chapters and verses uh, are things that were done later. 
Okay. So um, certainly the origins of much of what we have within our biblical text would have started in the oracular tradition or in the oral tradition as words or stories that were told by storytellers or griots or, 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 or those who were the keepers of the history. Uh, and so a lot of it would have, uh, particularly stories about Jesus or sayings by Jesus would have been retained by people who remembered them. Some of you, um, I, I watched it again just recently. I think somebody told me it was one of their favorite movies, The Book of Eli. I don't know, Nicole, if you told me that was one of your favorites. It is, it, it is. is. Okay. So, and if you remember, I'm, I'm saying like I'm talking about a whole bunch of Denzel Washington movies today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in The Book of Eli, Denzel Washington actually remembered everything that was uh, written in the Bible. And, and so when they, when he, when he finally, oh, people may not read the, read the, saw the movie, so I don't want to spoil it for people, but, uh, but he, 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 committed, he committed it to memory. So there was an oral tradition, but also even when it was first written down, it would have been written um, on vellum, which was animal skins first, later parchment, not necessarily designated uh, in the earliest forms until, until the scribal tradition came in of breaking it up into chapters and into verses. So um, perhaps, you know, he's talking to his disciples. Um, you know, if we continue on from what was happening in the previous dialogue, he's in conversation with the Pharisees, okay? Um, so I, I, I just wanted to ask those first two questions. I won't do all the rest of the other questions, but I just wanted to check in so we can at least know whose voice we're hearing. Uh, some of us would have the red letter Bibles and in the red letter Bibles, you would see because the text would be red and that's how you know yes. it's Jesus speaking. Mine is red. Uh, oh, you have that. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, you, so you have it and it t tells you when Jesus is speaking, but yes. what we don't have, it doesn't tell us who he's talking to. No, it <laughs> so, doesn't um, and, and so we, we, we can, we can, Make some judgments about that. Any other thoughts about the, these first 10 verses before we start at verse 11? And then I'm going to ask somebody to read us verse 11 through, um, through 21. It sounds like from that may be where we get the idea that uh, one of the many ideas that uh, Jesus is the way and it is only through Christ that we come to the Father. I kind of, when I was reading that, I was kind of thinking about that. Um, and that any who have come before him have not been, have not been the uh, true disciple, um, the true Messiah. And then the third thing was that if you're trying to get in by another way, by climbing over the wall or something, rather than coming through the gate, which means to come through Jesus, that, uh, you're not going to make it that way. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of all those things were kind of mixed in together. Well, you know, it, it maybe perhaps it does foreshadow because we're going to find Jesus actually saying that we, where we get that the, the words from that I am the way um, and that no one comes to the Father actually is said by Jesus later in the Gospel of John. Uh, if you go to the uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 6, then we'll see it there. Let me just see if I can pull it up here. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that comes later. So perhaps in some way, what we're, what we're reading here in chapter 10 does foreshadow uh, what, what Jesus uh, is, is saying later. But I, I also think it's important to note that they, they didn't understand him. They didn't understand what he was talking about. Like it says in verse six, he used this figure of speech or this parable with them, but they didn't know what he was saying. So he tries to say it again. I don't know that he's any more clear in the second part when he mm -hmm. says, oh, I am the gate for the sheep, you know, and, 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 and all who came before me are thieves and bandits. Um, you know, who's, who's, he, who's he talking about? Uh, but the sheep did not listen to them. Uh, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Like I'm, I'm trying to think metaphorically what all these things mean. What is the pasture and what does it mean to go in and go out? You know, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, you know, which, you know, the thief, 
and that language seems to be similar to what we would have as a description of Satan. Uh, but he says, I came that they may have life and mm -hmm. have it uh, abundantly. So uh, he, he is using some uh, parabolic language to try to explain a, a spiritual principle and theological um, uh, truth. And then you're going to find he shifts. He starts out here, he's the gate, right? And then he shifts to something else when we go to verse 11 uh, to 21. So I need someone to, to, who will volunteer to read 11 through 21? You have to pull it up, Reverend. We oh, can't see it. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Someone want to read that for us? Barbara, can you read that for us? All right, I read. And you want me to read through 21? Yep, down to 21. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. Again, the Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is out of his mind. Why listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Mm-hmm. All right. So we have a shift. He, he is now the good shepherd. More than just a gate by which people enter and exit into pasture, but now he's a good shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. And he contrasts it not with necessarily the thieves and the bandits who come before him, but now he describes what he calls the hired hand. Uh, some scriptures, I think the King James Version calls them the, uh, the hirelings. And, um, you know, and, and so we'll talk about who we think that, 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 that the hired hands are uh, that run in verse 13 that run away because they don't really care for the sheep. Um, and that he is known uh, by his own as the good shepherd uh, in the same way that he describes his relationship with the father. Right. And you remember, and Jesus had gone quite a bit into talking about when you see me, you see the father, you know, and, and talking about that connection. So now he parallels, you know, the kind of relationship that he's described that he has with the father as those who are the, uh, the, the, the flock of his sheep. Uh, and this was a question I remember I asked you all about a couple of weeks ago in terms of homework, like, what is the meaning of verse 16? Uh, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And, um, and then he talks about giving up his life uh, or laying down his life. And, and the thing I want you to pay attention to uh, in, in this passage is, is particularly verse 18. In verse 18, he says, no one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and what? I have power to take it up again. Interesting. I have received this command from my father. Uh, and then we find the division again, which is frequent in John. Uh, some calling him a demon again or crazy, possessed. Others still focused on the, the sign that he did in terms of opening the, the man who was the eyes of the man who was blind from birth, you know, others that are focused on his words. These are not the words of one who has a demon. So there's multiple divisions here. He is a demon. He's crazy. Shouldn't listen. Others are impressed by the, the, the content and the power of his words. 
Others are, are impressed by uh, his miraculous work of, of doing the spit in the mud and helping the blind man who was blind from birth to be able to see. So thoughts about this, this, this next section, 11 through 21. Questions, comments? I'm thinking the, the part that says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. Mm -hmm. uh, since initially he came to preach to, to the Jews, would, they, would that be people other than the Jews? Like, like the Gentiles. Gentiles, yes. Well, let me ask you this. Um, why do you say that he initially came to preach to the Jews? Well, because we, they are the chosen people. He came first among his own people. Well, certainly in the in the in the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew tradition, they saw themselves as being the, the chosen. chosen people, chosen by God. Mm -hmm. But specifically, I guess what I'm asking is from and and, and we know that he was born uh, to mm -hmm. a Jewish mother. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, and that he uh, was born in Bethlehem, which some prophets, uh, the prophecy had predicted that there would be a, uh, the Messiah would be born uh, out of the, out of the house of David in Bethlehem. And so we, we know where his origins are, but when you said that he came to preach to the Jews, that's why I'm wondering if, if we have evidence that, that, that say, uh, and, and, and I think there is some, you know, that, that, that he has a message that is to the Jews first. And I just want you to recall where we found that in the Gospel of John. Because well, we, do, we do find... I don't, know, I don't know exactly where it was in the Gospel when we go back, but when he went into the temple and took the scroll and read it. Was that in John? I said, I don't know if it's in John or not, but see, well, that's you, why you I get we're reading John, so you can tell me if it well, was. I know I'm reading John, but see, we've I've read other gospels too. But also, doesn't it come like from Isaiah, from the Old Testament? What what Jesus reads and In the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter Luke, four, okay, verse eighteen. <laughs> we read from the scroll of Isaiah, chapter Isaiah. Right, okay. one, uh, right. sixty-one and one. But in the Gospel of John, there's there there is a exchange. I'll give you some hints. There's an exchange that Jesus has with a certain person where he talks about the message coming first to the Jews. And I'm just, I'm just pop quizzing so we can, you know, tie in some of what it is that we've been reading recently. Am I remember who he had that conversation with? I know you do. I know, I know y'all remember it. Who's it? The woman I'll give you another hand. It's woman, a woman. The woman at the well? Yeah, it's a woman at the well. And he and he has this conversation this is in the Gospel of John chapter four. So this would have been, you know, several, uh, several chapters back. But uh, he, he talks very specifically about the relationship between the, the, the Jews and the Samaritans. Yeah. And, right. Uh, right. and let me just read here. It says... Uh, Chapter four, verse 20, the woman says to Jesus, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. And, you know, again, Jesus is expanding this conception of who it is that this worship is for and who this message is for with this conversation with the woman at the well that it goes beyond just their conventional kind of conceptions about mm -hmm. Jews and Samaritans. But he does it even further, you know, um, again, in chapter, uh, what is it, chapter two, um, when, um, where is it at? Um, 
I think it's in chapter two, when when Jesus has the conversation about um, his family, maybe that's not in chapter two. Um, and we and we learn about Jesus's brothers and sisters and. Uh, but again, in that passage, and, I, and I'm not able to put my finger on it right now, but it's when they say that your brothers and sisters are, are, are looking for you uh, because they thought that he was crazy and, they, and he had lost his mind and they wanted to take him home. And then mm -hmm. he said, no, well, who, 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 is my, who is my family? Who are my brothers and sisters? And it's all those who worship the one and true God. And so he, he's breaking out of these traditional conceptions of who goes first, of who has the information of who the worship is for. And I think that if we read what we find in 16, um, that we're, we're, we're finding a really a continuation of that message. You know, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. You know, Jesus is continuing to challenge and confront this narrow idea that his message, that his voice, that his words, that his worship, that his power is limited. It's limited based on the conventional ways that we think about relationships, whether that be family, brothers and sisters, whether that be the conventional views about what's for the Jews and what's for the Samaritans, uh, as expressed in this conversation in chapter four with the woman at the well. Um, and, and again here, that it's, it's bigger, it's more, it goes beyond uh, what we think. And how do, how do people know Jesus? What's the, what's, the way, what, what's, the, what's the way in which they're able to identify him? Are you talking about in John or now? In John. In John. Mm -hmm. What does it say? And I think you oh, said it earlier. It's in, been based on what they've been taught about their their ancestors and and all of that and what they learned from the temple because I thought most of them were not probably literate and they got the word from what was being taught in the temples. Mm -hmm. But again, he he he's building on this idea of his voice of recognizing his voice. He says it earlier in, in verse four. Um, in verse four, he says, uh, uh, when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep will follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger. They will run from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. And then he says here in 14, uh, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. Uh, and so here in verse 16, I have other sheep that do not belong to this world, but I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there's something familiar even about what he's describing as his voice that is gonna be a source of identification and recognition uh, that, that people will connect with. Well, uh, when he used to go to the mountains and, and the crowds would come and he would preach to them there, that might be one way of, of I, I think the voice may not be just the sound uh -huh. of his voice, but that that there will be something that he says. And again, the words are very important in John that will resonate with his own. That when you hear Jesus, that you will know Jesus because of, of, of the content, the sound. It's kind of like what I've said to us in prayer. Um, that it's so important for us as we pray to also listen and not just to have our own words, like our prayers just can't be our narrative and our monologues, that we have to take time to, to listen. And it's not necessarily something that we audibly would hear, but you know, we, we, we begin to make connections with the sound, and I'm using that in a, in a very metaphorical sort of way, the sound of God's voice in our prayers because we're spending time listening for it. We're spending time looking for it. We, we, we also then can, can see if what we hear in our head reconciles with what we read in God's word, which is why I've also said you have to have both prayer and study 
You know, mm-hmm. it can't just be that you you only just only just pray. That your 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 study of the Word of God is also an important part of your prayer life because you know God is not going to say anything to you that contradicts God's Word in other places. If you know God God is not going to 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 give you the inability to reconcile what it is that you have in your prayers and that you have in scripture. And if it's irreconcilable and the contradictions are fundamental and essential in such a way that you cannot, it's likely that what you're hearing is somebody else's voice. Maybe it's the voice of your own ego. Maybe it's the voice of some other uh, spirit that, that, that has occupied you or taken possession of you. But you know, we, 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 we are told that we will recognize the sound of the Good Shepherd's voice and that we will be known and will follow after the Good Shepherd because we will know it. I, I, I had a, a, there was a farmer friend, um, and this relates to some of what, what, what he says here. His name was in, in Greene County, Alabama, his name was Levi Morrow. And he, he raised cattle. Um, and he had, you know, probably, you know, 20, 30 cows that were out uh, in the pasture. And, and then, um, and, and he would say, uh, call him. And he said, what are you talking about? You know, he said, so he said call him, tell, tell, tell him it's time to eat. And we say, come on, come on, it's time to eat. You know, we are, hey, and, we, and we're saying all the different things. And he's just taking note of all the words that we're saying. Um, Hey, come on, it's time to eat, yo, you know, and then the cows just kept grazing, you know, they, they, they didn't move. And then he did it. And he said the exact same words that we said. And when he said, hey, come on, it's time to eat, all the cows looked up and started running <laughs> and ran towards us. <laughs> so they recognized the sound of his voice and they knew when they heard him, that there was good things that came, mm-hmm. that 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 he was the one that took care of them and that pastored them. Don't read the, the analogy too far because eventually, you know, cows get slaughtered and they get eaten you know, and everything else. <laughs> but in that moment, they knew that the sound of of, of their shepherd's voice, mm-hmm. they responded to that. It didn't, and it was, and I, and I always thought it was like dogs or cats or other pets that, well, not cats, because cats don't listen to anybody, but <laughs> dogs, the that dogs, would, the yeah. dogs would, hear, would, would recognize your voice and somebody else called them, but cows did the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they responded to his voice and, and, and that we also know here in this passage that they, he lays down his life for them, mm-hmm. unlike the hirelings, and the hirelings refer to maybe the leaders of Israel, you know, those who, who came in, those who, who actually were uh, uh, received some sort of tribute or payment, whether it came from the Roman Empire, whether it, whether it came through their connections with the, the, the temple or whatever else, they, they, they earned some financial benefit from it. And, and really that's why they were there. When the money wasn't there, they weren't gonna be there. And Jesus is making a distinction between who he is and who they are. Okay, any mm-hmm. more questions? And when he said that he would lay down his life, was that like what you said before uh, a preview of what was to come in terms of the crucifixion? It sounds that way. Yeah. Well, it, it for, well, and, I, and I missed that part. It, it definitely sounds like a foreshadowing, but mm-hmm. I want to just, I want us to pay attention to 18 that, and, and, and I say this because we can contrast it with what we're going to see in chapter 11 and other resurrection uh, stories, okay? So we know, and we've talked about before, and we're going to continue to talk about this as we move towards Easter Sunday, that there are multiple resurrections uh, where people who are dead or asleep and they come back to life, right? We know, we know that we're going to see one in chapter 11. But here, there's a distinction that's being made because Jesus says in 18, that I have the power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. We're gonna find these other people who we know who are resurrected did not resurrect themselves. Mm. They did not have the power to bring themselves back. Right. right. And Jesus describes something different about himself. 
He said, you didn't take my life. Mm. I gave it. You know, um, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it, take it up again. So I just want us to, to, to remember that as we go forward into 11 and we look at some of our other resurrection stories. And I do think it is a, it, it can be seen as a foreshadowing of his crucifixion, mommy, as well as his resurrection. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, who wants to read uh, 22? And we'll read 22 all the way to the end. We're gonna do uh, 20, 20 verses here, 22 to 42. Am I want to read? Nicole, Mariamu. Mm -hmm. Ma, go, are you sure? Come on, Ma. You want to go? Yep, go, Nicole. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Jesus is rejected by the Jews. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? Can if I, can you I watch you pause right there? Anybody know what the yep. festival of the dedication is? No, I don't. Hanukkah. All right. So oh. Hanukkah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. If you are, um, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the father's hand. The father and I are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answers, it is not for good works that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If those to whom the word of God came were called gods and the scripture cannot be annulled, can you say that the one whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming? Because I said, I'm God's son. If I am not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. Then they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing earlier and he remained there. Many came to him and they were saying, John performed no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Any questions or comments about this passage of Scripture, about this section here, about Jesus' rejection? He goes back to having these conflicts again with the, quote, Jews. And what Jews are, is, are we talking about? The Pharisees. Pharisees. Pharisees, the leaders. The you know, leaders. Could be Pharisees, could be Sadducees, the could Levites. be Herodians, uh, but they, they, they are, he's not talking about Jewish people in general. Jesus is a Jew. Uh, okay, so any questions or comments about this? I was looking at verse 34, Reverend. Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God's. Explain that. Well, let's just, let's, let's go to the scripture. He's, he's citing a psalm, passage of a, a verse from a psalm, in Psalm 82. And if you look at verse, so let's just read the whole psalm because we want to read it in context. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge justly and show partiality to the wicked? Justly. We don't say Selah. Selah is a pause. Pause. Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. 
So this is the, the when, he, when he says it is written in your law, what is that, verse 34? Uh, Jesus says, it, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods. If those to whom the word God came were called gods, and again, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to read some of these in the, um, in the original languages. And the scripture cannot be annulled. Can you say the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming? Because I said I am God's son. So is, is, is Jesus saying that he believes that everybody are gods? No, just children of the most high, maybe. Right. And, and but, do you do you see do you see a distinction in terms of the, 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 the English here? What do you see the difference between the, the God of, of of verse one and verse eight? It's lowercase g. It's a lower g. Yeah. Right, right. So you know, in in um in Hebrew, which is what the psalm would have been written in, there's a lot of different there are several different words that are used uh that, that, that English only allows for this, the translation of as God. You know, you have um, Elohim, uh, you have, uh, uh, which is a word that's not supposed to be pr pronounced in the, in, in the Jewish tradition, the Tetragrammaton, or what we might say Yahweh uh, is another. Uh, other places you would have Lord uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of uh, Adonai, that's the word, the Hebrew word for the Lord. Um, and so, and, and I, and I can't say that I, cause I, cause I don't want to, I don't want to say it wrong. And I'm trying to I have my Hebrew Bible, Hebrew Bible anywhere near me here where I could look it up. Um, but clearly the, here in the English, they're translating it differently or, or they're writing it differently in the English. So I'm assuming that there's different words here mm. that are being used for God versus uppercase versus God's lowercase. The mm. other difference is not just uppercase or lowercase. One is singular and one is plural. Mm. Um, and, and so, uh, but, I, but what I think Jesus is doing is it, it, it almost seems like a, um, uh, a, a, a rhetorical a, a rhetorical strategy that he's he's using because he's saying that you want to you want to kill me because you say that I say that I am God but in your own in your own law in your own scripture you have scripture that says I say you are God he doesn't quote it exactly I don't think right what does he say I said you are gods. Well, yeah, it does. It says I say. It does. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he said I said, and it says I say. So mm -hmm. um, I said you, but but he leaves out the rest of it. <laughs> Children of the Most High, all of you, you know. So he kind of just takes a portion out of it. And again, I say the rest of it because it didn't have verses originally, but there is a there is a complete statement that ends what we would say at the semicolon. Um, so I, it, to me, it almost seems like what Jesus is doing is confronting them with, and I'm going to go back to where we their own see words. Jesus's words, uh, confronting them with their own words mm -hmm. and talking about the extent that they don't even understand the things that they are saying. And they're supposed to be the teachers. They're supposed to be the learned ones. Mm -hmm. and Jesus, and they don't even know where he got his, his learning and teaching. You know, how does he know all of this stuff from the Bible? And yet when he puts it up to them, they have, they have no comeback at all. Yeah. If those to whom except the, the pick up stones, except the pick up stones. Yeah, just to kill them. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I think that, that Jesus is confounding them, confronting mm -hmm. and confounding them. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he confronts them to the extent that they don't even they, uh, understand the own words that they use, yet they're ready to move quickly to murder as soon as, as something that is said that seems to contradict not even their own law, but their own interests. Mm -hmm. Because that's really why it is that they want to kill them. Right. 
you know, it's not it's not because he just blasphemed, but the blaspheme has consequences in their eyes because if he's God, right. then they have to be subject to him. Yep. Not him being subject to them. And so, you know, I I um what what I what I'll do for next week is I'll do two things. Um, one, I'll pull I'll pull the Hebrew from Psalm 82, and I'll look at and we'll and I'll show you what word the language that they use for God versus gods in 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 um that that psalm and maybe I can you know do a little more research and unpack how we how we should interpret that. I'll also look at it here in the Greek to see if if they use theos if you know and if. The, the, the Greek is probably not going to be that sophisticated. That's one of the things that you, we begin to, to learn when you study these languages, that the Hebrew is a much more spiritual, sophisticated, and complex language um, for the study of theology versus the Koine Greek that we have, because this is a much more popular, regular, on-the-street sort of vernacular. So you don't always have uh, the 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 language to deal with a lot of um, high-minded theological concepts when it, when it's translated in the Greek. Paul does it in some of his letters, and he writes it with a little more sophistication. The Greek he uses is, is is different than some of what we find here in the Gospels. But the Gospels are written plainly, uh, so that you might believe. And again, we we find that at the end of John. That's why it was written. But I'll, but I'll also see if I can make some distinctions between the God and gods in, in, the, in the Greek from here. Um, hope that answered your question in part, Barbara, if I didn't confuse it even more. But I will, I'll, I'll try to bring back some more information next week. All right. Other questions about uh, this passage before we go to chapter 11? I was just thinking about the, the voice you said, and uh, that last verse there uh, talks about, uh, um, no, uh, for, uh, 41, mm -hmm. it says, many came to him and they were saying, John performed no signs, but everything that John said about this man was true. And I was just thinking about John when he said that he was a voice. Crying, you know, crying, crying in the wilderness. wilderness. That's that's that voice again. That you know, John had that voice because, and I we had mentioned that before that there wasn't anything that showed that John was doing any signs, wonders, or miracles, or anything. And yet, all these people were coming to be baptized. And so, yeah. what was it that was pulling them all there to be baptized? Except it was something in his voice, something within him that the, the spirit of God that 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 gave him that. Yeah, that was it. And, that, and that drew people to him. And if we yeah. read, you know, other other versions of uh, other gospels, we see, well, he was Jesus's cousin. <laughs> so maybe he had some of that, some of that same anointing on him. He's a son of, of, of Elizabeth, right? What? Uh, he, he jumped he, in the womb. He did her belly when Mary yeah. came to came to her. So yeah. yeah. The so, connection. Mommy, I mean, why don't you start and read us at, at uh, uh, chapter 11 and read down to verse 16. Okay. The death of Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who, who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, but rather it is for God's glory so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After <clears throat> having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. 
and you are going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. Mm. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring um, merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. All right. So I want us to continue to read on because we want to get all the way to the resurrection. So Barbara, can you read 17? To, and we're going to make note of your questions. We're going to come back. Barbara, can you read 17 to 27 for us? Yes. Jesus, the resurrection and the life. When Jesus arrived, he told that La he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he, that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. Amen. Amen. And Nicole, could you read 28? to 37. Okay. Jesus weeps. When she said, when she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and he is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Hmm. Then Jesus again, what, greatly disturbed. Just, stop there. Oh, stop there. Um, who hasn't read yet from 11? Barbara, did you, you read? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'll read 38. Um, then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, there's all, there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you all, I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Mm. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. 
Hallelujah. So let's go back and let's talk about this story. Let's talk about this, this account of the death of Lazarus and, and Jesus' resurrection of Lazarus. Thoughts and comments after you, 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 we just read this today. Anything that you see here you hadn't seen before? Any questions that you have that you didn't have before? Insights that you have? I don't understand what he, what Jesus was saying to the to the disciples about the the, the dark and the light there. Mm -hmm. What 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 was he the message he he was trying to get through to them right there? What do you think? I know you I know you said you don't know, but but I want to know what you think he's saying. I understand about Jesus teaching about the darkness and the light and that he and that Jesus is the light of the world mm -hmm. and that we are in darkness until we find that light. But I just didn't understand the the, the 12 hours of daylight and stumbling. I just didn't understand that whole I didn't understand the par. I mean, I think it's a parable, but I just didn't understand it. Well, did, has Jesus said something about an hour before? Where do we find in the Gospel of John? Again, like I said, we try to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Has Jesus made reference to hours before in, in John? When he says, you? my time has not come. My that hour, yeah. My hour has not come. My hour. Okay. And, and, and what did we say we thought that that meant when he said that? Wasn't time for him to, to, to be crucified. Wasn't time for him to be crucified. Mm -hmm. All right. So perhaps when he says that are there not 12 hours of daylight, those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, um, that perhaps he's speaking about uh, that he still has, has, has time, uh, you know, and, and so it, it might be safe to travel because you know there, there's there, there's a question about rabbi the jews were just now trying to stone you right and are you going to go there again right so again there, there's this concern about what jesus needs to do and when he needs to do it and whether or not it's timely for him to do it and so perhaps we sh we can read this this response from Jesus about hours of daylight uh, that uh, he, he does have the ability to travel safely because his hour has not yet come. He still okay. has time for, for daylight. Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. Uh, but then those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. And again, this concept of light is different than what we're just thinking about when we say physical light, right? Mm -hmm. Again, there are, there are multiple, because how could light be inside of you? But that's the way that the light that is described in by, by, by Jesus uh, is described, that he is the light of the world and that you can have light and darkness inside of you as well, mm -hmm. okay? So it's more than just the illumination that is caused by physical light, by sunlight, by candlelight, by torchlight, you know, he's talking about a light which is a um, uh, which is 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 something that can be internal as well as something that can be external. It's something that is spirit spiritual. Like we 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 sing about it. We say, "This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine." Mm -hmm. We're not talking about you know uh, a flashlight. We're not talking about a cell phone light. We're talking about an internal light. So, you know, I think we also can read, you know, Jesus's words, you know, in, in speaking about that. And, and again, he's responding. He, you know, this is when we ask the question, well, who's speaking and who is he speaking to? Mm -hmm. His disciples are saying to him, let's go to Judea again. Or he says, let's go to Judea again. And mm -hmm. they say, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so Jesus is answering them back. Right. So on some level, we need to try to interpret some of his answer, at least, as a response. That That's doesn't mean right. that Jesus always 
responds directly to questions. Yeah. Right? Sometimes yeah. Jesus gets asked a question and he yeah. asks another question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Jesus gets asked a question and he goes, especially in the Gospel of John, he goes off talking about whatever it is that he wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. And people are confused and don't know what, what, what he means. But well, that's the thing I hear from it. It seems to me clearly that the disciples or Thomas did not know what he meant because they say, I mean, he says, let's go with him so that we may die with him because they're expecting to get, when they get back to Judea, that they're, they're going to get killed. There's a possibility that they could get killed, but you're saying that Jesus recognizes that there is still time for him to get these things done that the disciples apparently don't understand. I think so. I think I think that's one way to read it. You know, and there may there may be more to it to that that, that that I'm not seeing. But I think that Thomas that you mentioned is also interesting here. Doubting so, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, doubting Thomas. Now right. see, the thing is, is that in other in other church traditions, we always talk about Thomas in this negative way. That he 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 he's the one that doubted. Remember when Jesus was resurrected, he he wasn't there the first time. And he says, I don't believe it. I need to see the, the wounds, mm -hmm. the hand, the, the holes in his hand and in his side before I will believe. So he's called Doubting Thomas. Here he's called something else. What is he, what is he called here? The twin. The twin. He's called the twin. Which and my Bible is. calls him Didymus, D-I-D-Y-M-U-S. Yeah, well, and you see down here, I was looking at the footnote here, that, and that, that's just the Greek word. Okay. For twin yeah. Didymus, um, and, and there's been and there's been a lot written about about him, uh, about the twin. Some would say, wait a minute, where am I here? Uh, that that sometimes he's called Didymus or the twin because he's double minded. Double minded, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I've heard, heard that before. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. that and and again, this may be an expression of his double mindedness that you know he is not able to hear the spiritual content of what Jesus is saying to, to him. He doesn't understand it. And then double-minded Thomas, Didymus Thomas, then says, hey, let's go that we may die with him. Now, again, I give him credit. I do too. Because I the other too. ones were like, we, he's willing to die for, with Jesus. Yep. He's willing to give his life. And so you could, maybe you should, we should, shouldn't call him Doubting Thomas. Maybe we should call him Courageous Thomas or Willing to Die Thomas, Ride to Die Thomas, mm. you know, because this is a different Thomas than, than we tend to talk about in church tradition as the one who just doubts and doesn't believe until he sees for himself. But again, double-minded. You know what? I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. See it. Mm -hmm. That he needs to have the, the, the physical and the spiritual come together mm -hmm. and then when he does get to touch the the wounds mm -hmm. what does he say my lord my oh god, my god. Yeah. you know the, the spiritual becomes manifest because he's able to touch the physical so mm -hmm. you know didymus the twin the doubter ride or mm -hmm. die you know i think there's different interpretations in terms of how we want to think about thomas so other, other other thoughts about this passage? Just real quick, yeah. I always think, yes, Thomas does get like a bad rap, but everybody always talks about when Peter denied Jesus three times, but we don't call him denying Peter. Everybody loves Peter. That's what the church is built on. But everybody just says so like, and I think most people really would probably be more like Thomas. It's just, it's just the way that people are. And so I kind of like maybe courageous Thomas right here. He's ready to die. And so- I like that we can we can think people are, are multifaceted, and so I think that's a good way to look at yeah. it. Yeah, and and in different moments and at different times, you know, I mean, it's interesting. The first time that that Jesus appeared uh, to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there, but it says that they were there, locked in a closed room. Yep. In fear yep. of the Jews. In fear, and they had Thomas run. wasn't in the room. Right. Thomas was in the streets. <laughs> Thomas was out there. You know, so that may say something about a better description as courageous ride or die Thomas better than 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 the doubter, because that for me that that might be a yet another example of showing that he didn't have the same fear that his other 
brothers who were disciples had, right. you know, because he wasn't locked in that room fearful in the same way that they were the first time that Jesus appeared to them. Hmm. Other thoughts about, about this, this resurrection story of Lazarus? Let me see, what does it have down here for D? Other thoughts about Lazarus? That he died, um, that, his, that his sickness wasn't unto death, that all of that was part of what was in the plan so that the people would see this miracle and, and see the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So that the sickness wasn't, even though he died, physically like we see it that that wasn't that he was going to be resurrected and, and that that was going to really be a way for even more than the, the 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 fishes and the loaves and and the healing of the blind and all of that when he resurrects this dead man that that is going to be to the glory of God so that everybody will know and that they will also glorify Jesus mm -hmm. Because so, it said, it, it said uh, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Mm -hmm. So, so you think Jesus, Jesus knew he was going to die? He right? absolutely. He knew that. Yeah. Right? He himself. He Jesus. said that. He said, for like, for your sake, it's good that I'm not there. He, I can't look where that, where that went. It'll be you. Can you move the screen? Um, no, before the um, what are we in? Here, hang on, it's further down. Jesus said, For your sake, I am glad that I was not there. Uh, 14. verse 14, 14, right? 14. Mm -hmm. So that you may believe. Like he really was like, this is going to be a moment that are going to bring a lot. And I do think the story of Lazarus, right? Because he's resurrected. We all still go like, wow. We always go like David in the lion's den, Lazarus raised from the dead, ra uh, uh, three, three teenagers in, in the fire, Rashak, Meshach, and Abednego. But Lazarus is always one of the stories. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that it makes you feel a little better. Like, um, you know, nothing happens without, without God say so. It's not, it's not going down like that. It's, it just doesn't happen because he's, he's asleep. <laughs> he's just asleep. Mm -hmm. And even though he had, you know, remember he had brought other people back to life, but he is going back to Judea where the people who really want to kill him, where those people live, and he's going to do it in, it's like in your face. He's in four days in the tomb, stinking dead. Everybody yeah. knew he was dead. He went, Everybody some of the people had right. died, the little girl, the boy. This is dead, stinking dead in, in grave right. clothes. That's right. got to be cool. Oh, yes. Yes, four days. Yes, not, you know, right. 12 hours or, you know, coming because my child is dying and, you know, and all of that. But no, four days. There wasn't no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. Right. Right. So if he knew that he was going to die, mm -hmm. what's going on here? Verse 35, the most, the shortest verse they say in scripture, right? Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Here it's, it's four words in the New Revised Standard Version. <laughs> Jesus began to weep. Mm -hmm. uh, King James is Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Yeah. Why is he crying? Oh gosh. Interesting. We all we all familiar with that part of the story too, right? Lazarus mm -hmm. raised from the dead. But we're also familiar with the easiest Bible verse to learn. You know. Which is, John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Two words. That should be your first memory verse. Right. Right. Maybe they, they don't tell us. We have to. We're interpreting. So we yeah. whatever we guess we can they, guess. We think he was they, disturbed. They, they have their interpretation. What's their interpretation of why he's crying? That that he loved. That he loved so him so much. But I just thought maybe Jesus knew what he had gone through in death already. And maybe, maybe that was why. And maybe, I, and I, you go go the pain. 
I heard it a different way. I've heard pastors say that Jesus was weeping, not because, why would you weep if you know you can bring somebody back to life? Jesus was weeping at them, at the sisters. Jesus, if you had been here, my Lord, both of them said it. My Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. He's getting a little tired of it. Like, how many times do I have to do this for you all to believe me? Don't you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? So he's weeping because he's just like, when are my kids going to grow up? Believe what I say. So that's, but I still, that's still, that's just our I think, interpretation. I think, it's a good one. Interpre- I think it's a good interpretation. That is, yeah. If you continue to read, it yeah. says, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind may have right. kept this man from dying? So here they are. Oh, it's the same thing like the thief yeah, on the again. cross. Yeah. Oh, if you are who you say you are, save yourself and us. Uh-huh. You know, um, and then what does verse 38 say? Greatly disturbed, he came to the tomb. No, not, not just greatly disturbed. Then Jesus, again. Again, again, again right. Again, greatly, greatly disturbed. disturbed. Yeah, like, come on. So so this this this, this is something that is, is building up. It's suggested in the text Ooh. that Jesus is, again, again. repeatedly, yeah. more than once, now greatly disturbed and so then he comes to the tomb and it was a cave and the stone was lying against it and then he begins to do what it is that he came to do so so that god may be glorified and Mm -hmm. jesus said in verse 40 did i not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of god and so they took away the stone and then he begins to pray father i thank you for having heard me i knew that you always hear me but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing. It's almost like he, he may be whispering this under his breath. <laughs> so they may <laughs> believe that you said this. Uh, and when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So, yeah, I do think, you know, and oftentimes that's, that's a Sunday school, school question. Why did Jesus, why did Jesus weep? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll find again, we, we, we find it, all, you know, um, in... In another passage of scripture, another gospel, uh, Jesus weeping. He actually weeps twice. There's two places in the Bible where Jesus weeps. But the second time he weeps, he also weeps for similarly that they, that the people just don't realize what it is that is coming. They don't realize who it is that he is. You still don't see me. Over and over and over again, they keep getting confused about the signs, about the words. He tells them they don't believe him. He says it. They don't hear it. He shows them. They don't acknowledge it. They, 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 they come after him with stones. You know, they're walking around in darkness. And, you know, um, and these are Jew. And, and again, he refers to the Jews here. And here it doesn't seem like it's it's suggesting the leadership so much, but these are just the general folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 but he's wanting them to see. And then Lazarus comes out, and then I want us just to to, to quickly try to move on. Uh, well, and before we do that, there's one thing I just I, I just find interesting because it's a similar word that's used. 44. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound. Now, one way that we could translate, because it's the same words that are used in another story that we've heard, the dead man came out and his hands and feet were wrapped in swaddling clothing. Mm. Mm-hmm. The, same, mm. the, the, the same language, the same word that's used to describe Jesus when he's in the manger. Remember, wrapped in swaddling clothing? Mm-hmm. That, that actually, what, that, what it says is strips of cloth. Now, they mm-hmm. translated the strips of cloth here, um, and but... It's the same thing. Mm. So, to, so to see to 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 see a um, a even a foreshadowing of resurrection of that resurrection. Jesus is as a as a baby mm. was wrapped in a death shroud. Ooh, mm-hmm. ooh, that's good. Okay, that he came to die. He was mm-hmm. wrapped in the same sort of clothing, the same strips of cloth. Mm. that Lazarus is wrapped in here at the resurrection. It's the same words. Same words are used here. 
You okay. said Jesus cried two times. What was the other time? It's in it's before he goes into Jerusalem. Oh, when, when he, he looks, weeps when he over the city, he looks into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yes. He weeps. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. So, but I just want to point out that swaddling clothing. You know, because lots of times when we when we tell our Christmas stories, the swaddling clothing is oh, it's it's beautiful, it's like a little bunting, yeah, a little bunting. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. pure. It's all yeah. gle gleaming white. Well, we missed it. It's rags, and it's really what you wrap up dead bodies in. Mm. Oh my gosh. And so that's how Jesus, born to die, but not only born to die, but born mm. to die and be resurrected. Uh, and I and I was seeing the tomb again where Jesus was crucified in the stone. And they moved the stone. Yeah. True. I mean, we have to see that language. That 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 all of that he 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 is he's rolling the stone away. You know, and 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 they are bearing witness to the glory of God, but they do not recognize what it is that they're seeing. I want to read uh, uh th this plot to kill Jesus. Many of the Jews, because I think this is important, and I, and I emphasized this last Sunday. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him, okay? But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So some became believers, some became snitches, okay? And so the chief priests and the Pharisees called to meet on the council and said, what are we to do? And this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation and we'll lose our jobs. <laughs> I had to that. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he had prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. Jesus no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there to a town called Ephraim, Ephraim in the region near the wilderness and remained there with his disciples. And now with the Passover of the Jews was near and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and were asking one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? And now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders to anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them should let them know so that they might arrest him. And I just want to show also because it's and it's at the beginning of twelve that um, Lazarus, uh, where is it at? The plot to kill Lazarus. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because Jesus, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. And that tells everything about them right there. They yep. didn't care whether he was the Messiah or not who he was. It had to do with them having the power. Yeah. But also going to try to kill a guy who's already been raised from the dead. Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, are they going to fight against God? I mean, <laughs> you're not going to win this. He's going to. Mm. Yeah. So it tells you where exactly where they are. Yeah, and, exactly and, 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 where they are. And, and, but they can kill the revolutionary, but they can't right. kill, the, kill revolution. the revolution. Hallelujah. I had a question. I had always thought if someone said, uh, tell me the story of Lazarus, that the, the broad strokes I could give. But when I read it, right, not what we think, but actually read the text, Lazarus was dead four days. And I thought about Jesus and I thought, I don't know this. Why did Jesus only die three days? Is that I'm, everything seems to have a meaning? I'm sure there's a, you know, a good Friday and then but early Easter Sunday morning. I'm like, why was it three? Mm -hmm. I just is that. Well, let me let me read let me read a footnote, and you may have this in your Bible. Okay. Um, for, for verse 17, 11, 17, it says, In the tomb four days. Jewish custom at that time required that burial take place the day of death, if possible. Jewish belief also held that the soul lingered near the body for three days, so that death was truly final on the fourth day. Uh, Jesus, oh. 
Two day <laughs> delay plus one day's travel each way between Bethany and Jesus' location across the Jordan would make four days if Lazarus died and was buried on the same day the messenger left Bethany to report his illness. Oh, good question, Nicole. Yeah. But more importantly, I should have just read that because, yes, the Bible you sent me has it right there. <laughs> yeah. reading the commentary. I, I, I sent right. that to you. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Dang, missed it. Okay. So he was dead. So on I'm day glad four, you asked because, yeah, that's on day point. four, he was dead, dead. He was dead, dead. Right. Yeah. He was dead, dead. <laughs> Wasn't no spirit lingering. Right. And they Hang couldn't out. say it. Yeah. The people couldn't say anything. Because, oh, well, the blood. spirit was already still there. And he right. Was dead, dead. At, at, at day four. That's why I say he's stinking already. Right. You know, the stench of the grave is already uh, already there. So the 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 glory that 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 would that would be achieved was even greater because on day four, dead dead. But as Nicole said, Jesus, like, Jesus was on yeah. three days. Yeah, why didn't Jesus do four days then? Well, you know, the thing is is that from 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 a from a spiritual from a spiritual standpoint. Again, you got to remember when he was resurrected, who was the first witness? Mary. Mary. And Mary. why was she going? To uh, anoint him with oils and whatever for the... So she was going death. to complete the, yeah. what would happen on the third day. And and, and we don't say that, that, that Jesus, again, and this is later church tradition, that he descended into hell... There, there, there was there was spiritual work that 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 was happening in this separation period. Like we we don't know well what happened on day one and day two and day mm -hmm. three, but it's all a spiritual work. There was spiritual activity. This this process of him being resurrected, of him of, of him returning, you know, was a spiritual resurrection. You know, it, it was it was for us to see, to see that he had returned, and he returned with a new body. Right. He wasn't recognized. They didn't see him. We'll we'll deal with more of that later when we get to that. But when Jesus returned in his resurrected body, in his spiritual body, he was not recognized. Mary didn't thought he was the the gardener. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if 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 my Lord is still here, tell me where he is so I can go and because. She's completing the burial rites and the burial rituals. And so, Jesus uh, said specifically, if you tear down this temple in three days, he said three days. Right. He, so, he, also, he, all, he also foreshadowed the, the, the three days. And there's lots of thoughts about why three days. Some say, you know, there's a Trinitarian mm -hmm. form. Formula. That's what I thought. There's a numerological mm -hmm. reason behind the number three in terms of what that represents you know, in terms of completion. I mean, there's lots of different thoughts and ideas about it. I don't know that I have the answer for that. I mean, I could give you a number of theories and ideas. What I, what I would say about Lazarus is what, and what I agree with what's found in the footnote here is that on day four, Lazarus would have been clearly understood as being dead, dead, and there was nothing else that anybody could do. Okay. Okay. Jesus as he said earlier in chapter 10, by his own power, right. Right. lay down his life and picked it back up. So there wasn't a need for, it, it wasn't about, you know, some, some may, maybe some could argue that after, if it was three days, Lazarus could have brought himself back. I don't know. Mm. But certainly after four days, they would have thought he's gone. Right. There's nothing but dead body there. There's nothing. He's still, there. Right. That's right. yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Mm. Good stuff. Good any stuff. other any other questions or comments before we close out? So um, we are going to continue on uh, for next week, and we're going to read uh, chapter twelve. Chapter and 13, it, it, you know, 13 is, well, I don't want to read 13 yet. Let's just do, let's just do chapter 12 mm -hmm. because chapter 12 um, concludes with a summary. And then in 13, we're going to deal with the foot washing uh, in terms of what we find uh, from Jesus at the festival of Passover. And that is, I, I want, I want to hold off on that a little bit till we get a little bit 
further into Lent. Can I ask a question about Lent, the, the, the book that you said for us to get to read? Yeah. How are we supposed to be reading it day by day on? Yeah, or? well, there's a, there's, a, there's a devotional for each day. Yes. So uh, today was, what did I read today? Today is day eight. Um, yeah. In, okay. in Lent. The first day of Lent would be Ash Wednesday. Which it would, would be Ash Wednesday. That would be the first one. 17. Okay. Yeah, that would be the first day. Okay. So yeah, we're reading it day by day. You know, I, I'll 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 tell you that, um, and I've been reading it, uh, and I didn't read this book in its entirety before I recommended it, and mm -hmm. and I'll just say now that I'm reading it, there's some things about it I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the things that I don't like is it's obviously the folks who wrote this or the person who wrote this is a part of this group that believes in the, what they call ADOS, A-D-O-S, the American Descendants of Slavery. And that, that group seeks to distinguish themselves um, in their identity from other African people. Uh, they say, you know, we are ADOS, we are the American descendants of, of, of slavery. And they use that as a basis for a reparations for argument. Reparation, yeah, I saw that in yeah. the sample. And I just, I completely reject that. I completely reject that whole concept or idea. But there was nothing that I could read about the book that told me that that was inside of the book. Um, I mean, I read a lot of reviews about it. I read some excerpts and, you know, I didn't find any of that. So I'm, I'm still reading it every day because there's some good history there. Um, but I have, I have a problem with it. <laughs> so, but to answer your question is, I read it every morning. I, re I read it as, as, as a grounding and rooting because I do think it does give some good history and some good perspective on um, the need for repentance in the face of the legacy of slavery and the repentance that comes from both white people and black people. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me that a lot of it seems to be directed towards white people, white people. as mm -hmm. a way to lead them to think they need to pay reparations. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a strong reparations uh, proponent. I certainly believe, though, that all African people right. are deserving of reparations, whether they're in Jamaica, right. whether they're in the Caribbean, whether they're in Africa. And, um, and, they, and they try to draw this nativist sort of mm -hmm. narrow um oh. carving out of this of somehow and that and that our identity was defined in slavery that you know i, I was I, I was uh uh an african before I, I was in bondage and so i don't define my identity if you look on facebook i i've had i had a heated debate with some of these folks you know months ago um but it is what it is i, I read lots of books with uh, from people i don't agree with so Half of my time in seminary, I was reading books from people I didn't agree with. So, um, but but yeah, it's a daily devotional. So just read you read one every day. Okay. And you got to eat the fish and spit out the bones. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Reverend, Hello? I had a question about that book also, and uh -huh. um, I appreciate what you said about this organization. Um, and and I you know I I have had had thoughts about them and didn't know that about that whole thing about people who are descended from people who are enslaved in this country but um aside from that confusion in my mind um uh so there's 40 days of devotions but um if you the calendar days from ash wednesday to resurrection day is more than 40 mm -hmm. and and if i understood last year sundays. you said sundays don't count Right. Yeah, yeah. So technically, so that's a thank you. That's a good clarification. So you wouldn't read a devotion on Sunday. Right. So it, 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 it would just it would just be uh, the the days of the week. What is it? Monday through Saturday. Monday through Saturday. Uh, uh -huh. but yeah. And that's why there's 40 days, because, yeah, when you when you do all of Lent, which goes from uh, February 17th. And I believe it's to April the 3rd because because Easter itself is not counted as a right. Um, right. Then it's a 
I think it's 46 days. 46 mm -hmm. days total. That was a number I remember you saying last year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so okay. you really need to read one mom on um, on Sunday. <laughs> Again, and I have to apologize to folks. I mean, I, I I don't think it was a bad investment, even you know, to, to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get some of the history because it's yeah, really, I agree really mm -hmm. together. But I absolutely mm -hmm. have have vigorous disagreement with some of the uh, assumptions that are mm -hmm. that are the basis of, mm -hmm. of of how mm -hmm. it's, it's structured. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but all right, let's pray. Uh, so, so next week we'll just do twelve. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll just do twelve. Okay, just. just yeah, just chapter 12. Let's pray. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for the blessing of this day, for the, the opportunity to study your word and to follow after your way. Guide us and lead us, direct mm -hmm. us and protect us, and just continue to open our eyes to see new things about your scripture. We're excited. Mm -hmm. We're excited about the new things and, the, and the, the, the new discoveries that we can see when we actually take the time to read, to digest, and to receive the word of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together and say together. Amen. 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 Right to all. Thank you. God bless Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Enjoy you the rest too. of the day. Yeah, looking forward to, looking forward to tonight. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Looking all. forward to tonight. Yes. Yeah. I won't I Amen. won't be on tonight. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, I, I um I, I I thank you all for your support. I, I I think I'll probably get a copy of it that I'll be able to to have afterwards, um, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I'm going to start to get myself prepared uh, for tonight. All right. All right. We're with you. Right. We're with you. Bless you. Right. Love you. Enjoy yourself. Right. Bye, Barbara. Indeed. See you tomorrow morning. Bye, Sharon.